I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we are talking to a remarkable woman who spent a quarter of a century living with the poorest of the poor in a very poor nation, the nation of Cambodia, a nation that survived a genocide attack by a brutal dictator and a brutal regime. Her name is Jan Ritzkis, and we are delighted to have her here on Spotlight today. And we'd like to thank the folks at Good River Print and Media for helping us put Jan and her book, I am who I am, my 25 year journey with the poorest in Cambodia, putting them both in the spotlight today. Jan, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Logan. Let's start out with a little background for the folks at home. Who was Pol Pot and what was the Khmer Rouge? Uh, well, it was during the time of uh, when the philosophy of communism was such a big deal in, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got, Cambodia got caught up in the Vietnam War. So there was the secret bombing here in Cambodia. It did give rise to a group called the Khmer Rouge. And Pol Pot thought he would be the ultimate communist. Mm -hmm. um, basically, he believed that he had to bring the country down to ground zero, destroy everything and everyone, and then rebuild it uh, according to communist ideology. In that process, he was very, very brutal. And um, a quarter of the population either died or uh, left the country. He so was much was, like Mao Zedong, where he thought that the people from the city should go to the country, that they needed to be re-educated, and that everything had to be equal, and that political enemies should be disposed of. Uh, yeah. It was very similar and very brutal. Yes, and, and people were seen as things rather than uh, as human beings. So they were all dispensable. Life was cheap. Exactly. Um, and it was also a regime that uh, uh, starvation <clears throat> was a norm. Uh, you know, don't treat the people as human beings. I think that that's uh, probably the most horrific thing. Everything was destroyed, all the systems, you know, you're talking finance, education, um, uh, medical care, everything was destroyed uh, deliberately. And so, you you know, he really did want to bring the country down to ground zero. And he believed that if he destroyed everything, all the systems, everything that we're used to, um, then he could rebuild. Mm -hmm. And this type of destruction obviously has repercussions even till today. Yes. Well, the uh, it's it's current history. It's not ancient history. Right. Uh, so all of my staff are Khmer Rouge survivors. I haven't met anyone, Logan, um, who didn't lose 95% uh, of their family members uh, during this era. And uh, that's something that, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress is very current. Um, it, it not only impacts the survivors, it impacts their children because they're very fearful people and they pass the fear on to their children. Um, so it's a country, yeah, it's coming out of the dark ages. Yeah. How did you learn of this plight and what about it motivated you to go and do more than send money, do more than to talk about it, but you actually went to live there and to help. Well, I was a Vietnam War child. So mm -hmm. I was a teenager when the Vietnam War was uh, uh, active. Uh, also, you have to be, remember that was the beginning of television. Mm -hmm. And so we, we got, you know, uh, journalists weren't embedded yet. Uh, so we got our first hand view of things. Um, knew about Cambodia, knew what was happening here, watched the bombing, um, and knew that one day I would be here. Mm -hmm. uh, about working with the poor, I, I've known that since I was a small child. It's a passion. It's who I am. Now, were you raised with those kind of values? I mean, it almost sounds like you have like a missionary type background or a religious background that might uh, push you in that direction. Well, I think I grew up with immigrant parents who had gone through, you know, two world wars, a depression, and, and you name it. They immigrated to Canada to, uh, you know, give us children a chance. Mm -hmm. um, 
passion to helping others was the norm. They're they're people of faith, and I'm a person of faith. Um, and uh, I think the mandate, our greatest mandate, is to love one another as I would have people love me, you know, kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it was kind of the norm. People struggling, coming out of uh, deep deep hurt. Mm-hmm. And and rebuilding their lives and and not just for yourself but for your neighbor, anybody who needed help, you helped. Tell me how old you were when you went over to Cambodia and what that was like. I was forty four when mm-hmm. I went. Um, <laughs> it was, oh, you know, you kind of step back. The con- the the country was destroyed. I you know, ninety five percent of the people were in abject poverty. Uh, they lived in small thatched huts, two meters square for people, families of eight living in it. No water, no electricity, no anything. And this um, is the 1990s now. This is 1992 when I arrived. I started Tabitha in 94. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was uh, it, guns everywhere. A lot of insecurity, landmines everywhere. Um, streets weren't paved, you know, it was uh, kind of like the re- Ukraine right now, what's happening there, that total destruction and uh, total hurt. What was the government like and what is the government like now? It's still a communist country, I believe, right? Uh, I would probably say socialist as okay. opposed to communist. Um uh, when I arrived, uh, the political situation was pretty rough. We had warlords everywhere. Everybody wanted to be boss. Everybody had guns. Uh, to take a life cost you five cents. Um, and if I don't like you, the way I look, I look at you, I, well, just shoot them. You know, right. that kind of thing. Um, a lot of political parties. Um, a lot of words. A lot of insecurity. Um Streets were empty by four in the afternoon. The Khmer Rouge were still active. Uh, we were in the countryside. I mean, the country came to a standstill at four in the afternoon because they would come out. And they were not nice people. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. Now, um, I think the prime minister has done an extraordinary job of rebuilding the country. Mm-hmm. Uh providing security. This is something that the country didn't have for 40 years. Um, Focusing on things like education, healthcare, um, you know, it's just a, he's a benevolent, loves his people. Hmm. uh, Doesn't like the world at large, but he does love his people and he does his best for them. And, and the change in the country is, unbelievable it's remarkable so you're going to a country that's completely destroyed where there's lots of violence where your life is in jeopardy really at the whim of some gunmen um where were you living uh what was that uh, situation like and uh tell me how you got involved actually to start helping because you probably had to take care of yourself first, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you always have to do that. Yeah. Um, I basically I I cashed in my pension, sold everything I had, and uh, used that money to start. Uh, we rented an office at the time. The United Nations uh, was here, the peacekeepers, so rents were very inflated, uh, so it was really hard to get a place. And uh, so I lived in the office uh, that we had. Um, part of the house had no walls, just screen netting. Mm. It, had to, it had to be cheap. Eh? Um, it was pretty neat. Um, and then uh, the first big rains, uh, the whole building flooded and it was horrible. Uh, so then, you know, we got another place. Um, the first few years were, were tough, but I had good friends here, developed mm. good friends uh, who made sure I had food which was nice. And um, yeah, it was good. Um, You have to have wisdom, eh? You learn wisdom in a country like this. Um, You learn to listen to the people a lot. So you know where the problems are, uh, you know. What about language? Neighbors. Language. 
like speaking like, with them in their native tongue, were you able to? How were you able to communicate? I still can't speak Cambodian. I can speak it a little. Right. Uh, what I've learned over the years is that if I speak their language, they don't listen to me. Hmm. But if I speak English, everybody has to focus. Right. And so the discussion starts of any new concept because there's, you know, Cambodia stopped in 62. The development of language stopped. The development of uh, uh, education stopped. So their language is back in the 60s and we're living in the 90s where the world has, you know, evolves. It always evolves, uh, changes. And so there was a lot of words like community development. There's no such word in uh, in Cambodia. Uh, talking about savings, there's no such word. Right. Uh, so if I spoke English and they asked me what it meant, then the discussion started. And what I found is that people actually learn and think about and understand what we need to do much quicker than if I spoke Cambodian. Number one, I wouldn't have the, there's no words for these things. Mm -hmm. So something like community development is a paragraph in Khmer, you right. know? So it's it's that kind of thing. What, was, secret. what was your work before you arrived in Cambodia? Well, I did the similar things in uh, Kenya, East Africa, and I was in the Philippines for eight years doing the same thing. And I worked in Skid Row uh, when I was in uh, college in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mm -hmm. So all of those things taught me um, how to do the work, what okay. not to do, how to see people, how to understand things. For example, I learned that pity gets you nowhere. Yeah. Um, if you really want to help people, then you got to get them to make that choice and come up with systems that allow that choice to happen. Um, so I can tell you what to do, Logan, mm -hmm. uh, but you still have to decide whether you're going to or not. Right. I have a system that says, okay, what would you like to do and how would you like to do it? And I'll support that. That's a different thing. You, yep, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, as my mom used to like to say. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about Tabitha and the formation of that. Well, when I arrived here, like I said, everything was kind of in a bit of a turmoil. So go to the government. I, if you're going to work overseas, you must register. You must respect the government. You may not like it. That's, mm -hmm. that's a different issue. But you have to respect the rules of the land. So I went to register and they, you know, it was uh, in flux. The whole thing was in flux at the time. And what they said to me was basically, Jan, you go out and you do the work. In a few years when we're settled, uh, you know, I've learned a long time ago, Logan, that it's what you do that's important, not what you say. And so uh, we were really fortunate and. I got good staff and uh, very, very traumatized people, very frightened. Uh, just getting them out of the office every day uh, was a challenge. Um, um, they had very clear expectations of the poor. They were all evil people and, you know, that kind of thing. Changing those habits and making sure they understood they were poor too, you know, mm. so... If you say they're evil, are you evil? That kind of thing. So, yeah, it was uh, the first, I would say the first five years was a lot of work with post-traumatic stress, um, recognizing their own value, recognizing the value in others. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you bring out the best in people? And, and What were your objectives when you went there to get people clothed and fed, educated? Yeah, but in a system that allowed them to be able to do that. Mm. So if, if you know, I could say to you, you have problems, you would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would give you $100, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd say, now your problems are solved forever. Right. Now you and I both know that's silly. Yeah. Um, if I put in a system that allows them, number one, uh, people 
are terrified. They're very frightened people. So you cannot build a system that incurs threat. Mm. So you have, uh, you know, if I give a loan, I have a threat, right? If you don't right. pay, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Um, so coming up with savings, uh, number one, you have to decide it's your money. Are you worth it? And, and that was a very difficult thing. The number of tears people went through to make that decision was unbelievable. We had people who cry, just sob and sob and sob steadily for about 10 days. And every day we'd come and all, all, all we asked was, are you worth it? Are you worth this towel? Are you worth this cup? I mean, they're talking very simple things, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like us. There's something in their family that's that's an irritant that starts the day off wrong. And often it was simple little things like if I had a towel mm -hmm. to dry myself off with, I would be rich. Mm -hmm. And okay, so how come you don't have it? And they would say, you know, I don't have money. And I said, well, you got store-bought clothes. Yeah, they're secondhand clothes, of course, but still they're store-bought said clearly you have some money and they would say yes that's the that's the thing some um uh, i have to tell you they you know they would say pennies a week but that's all it costs for the towel you see right. and then um the day they would say i'm worth it is the day we started savings it was the day too that their lives began to change they were in charge it was their money the other issue was that we had to be trustworthy you know, they've coming out of a system that wasn't trustworthy. And the only guarantee was death if you don't do as we say kind of thing. Um, so we have their money. We're protecting it for them. But we also have to make sure we give it back. And, and putting that trust in us, that took a lot of courage on a lot of uh, people's parts. And so at the end of 10 weeks, we give them the money and we give them three days. And we'd say, OK, now you got to buy that thing. We never bought anything for anyone and we'll be back and we'll take a picture. And that's what we did. So in a lot of ways, we were cheerleaders and it was only a couple of cycles when people started to uh, buy things that would earn them an income. Uh, so they start with chickens, love chickens. Chickens are the best thing in the world. Yeah. You know? And uh, you're not going to starve if you have a chicken. Well, it was not only that, uh, chickens multiply very quickly. Right. And they're good income, eh? And they're yeah. good source of protein and, you know, things like that. Yeah, that's what Bill Gates says. If he had to, like, live in poverty, the one thing he'd want is a chicken or probably a chicken and a, a rooster. Would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's and, amazing. And, and, yeah. And then, you know, they combine that, eh? They, what we did is it's a 10 week cycle. So people who cannot see the future, cannot plan for the future, that 10 week cycle started getting them to think, okay, every 10 weeks I can have the next thing. So they'd put the chickens with the savings and then they put the pigs, chickens and the savings. And I have to tell you some of our, a large number of our families really started earning big income for here. Right. Uh, and that could purchase a lot from here because, you know, uh, food was cheap yet and, and still is in many ways. It's changing. It's becoming more normal. But mm. at that time, yeah, it was good. Yeah. Well, it's amazing the structure that you gave them to kind of empower their own lives. I think in education, they call it scaffolding, where you actually give them the structure to, uh, go out to save, to buy, to, to become productive members of society because so much has been unlearned and uh, deprived from them that they don't know the basic things. Do you think you'll wind up living out the rest of your days in Cambodia? No. Uh, nope. no it's time to pass it over to younger people. Cambodia has changed dramatically. Um, uh, our first house building team, we had a fellow, Jonathan would give me a hard time all the time, you know, because things were pretty tough. Uh, they were building houses in the middle of a coup attempt. And I said, don't worry about it. You know, you're not the target. Mm -hmm. and, and knowing the difference, uh, that's very important. And he said, oh, Cambodia will never 
develop. I said, if they have security, watch it. Hmm. And that's what they've had. And uh, if you see Cambodia now, you see Phnom Penh now compared to what it was when I arrived, it, it looks like New York City. Amazing. Amazing. And, yeah. and, um, uh, it's got to feel good to be part of that, that you came in when it was rubble and now you've been there through the rebuilding. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, I've lived a really privileged life. I really have. It's been a tremendous, uh, rewarding life. Um, you know, we changed at least a quarter of the country. And the government's very aware of it. The people are aware of it. Um, it is nice to know that. Yeah. Well, you know, a big ingredient is you're you're a brave person. I mean, that you leave the comfort <laughs> of your home. I don't know if I would use that word, but hey. Well, you okay. know what? A brave person doesn't think they're brave. And just because you're brave doesn't mean you don't have fear. You know? That's right. That's the thing. I mean, a brave person steps up even though they're scared to death. So yeah. uh, I think it's wonderful what you've done. Now, did you adopt a daughter as well? I did. Tell me uh, about that. Well, uh <laughs> Okay, so the United Nations was here. One of the gifts they left behind was AIDS. And uh, AIDS is, uh, it takes a couple of years before it takes a really big effect. Uh, so by 98, it was uh, very prevalent. We had whole villages that we worked in where there was no survivors between 25 and 40. They'd all died of AIDS. And it was all new to Cambodia. Uh, it was a horrible thing hmm. and uh, uh, poverty is something we don't understand logan yeah um people sold their children hmm. uh, into the sex trade but they sold them not because i'm greedy but because there was some incident uh, another child in the family would die with, without money to buy medicines that kind of thing uh, and miriam's mom was one of those I also, uh, we got stuck with an orphanage. <laughs> and so we had placed children. And when we were finished, um, we worked with Mother Teresa's group, the Missionaries of Charity, and we had given them our leftover furniture. And they also asked that I would help them place other children. In that process, uh, Miriam's mom came into their care and she died giving birth. She actually had full-blown AIDS. Uh, Miriam was born at seven months. So she was a kilo when I first saw her. And um, her mom bled to death. It took 11 days because people were scared of the disease, right. just like we're all kind of terrified of COVID right now, that kind right. of similarity. Oh, I remember that era. It was, people were scared to death to shake hands, just like COVID, like you said, yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, Miriam... At that morning that I first met her, the sisters had called me, Sister Lily, and she said, oh, Jan, I need a parents for this little one. And walked into the orphanage, and, and there was this couple that I had brought along. And uh, so Miriam's really tiny. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I said to the Sister Lily, what's, what's her problem? How did she come here? And mm -hmm. she said, you know, about her mom died giving birth had AIDS and I said what about Miriam is she positive mm. she said I don't know we don't have money to test her so mm -hmm. and there was only the ELISA test which is a very basic test for mm -hmm. AIDS at the time so we had her tested and the next morning there was a choir from a local school singing Christmas carols mm -hmm. to the kid and they were singing away in a manger and the prospective parents and us were there and uh I said, the, the results came in for Miriam and they were positive. And the parents looked at me and Ma Lillian and they said to us, oh, God would want us to have a perfect child. And I turned around, still a little embarrassed, not really, but I was yeah. really angry. And I turned around and I said, well, thankfully, God wants her to have perfect parents and you're not it. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. uh, but to make a long story short, uh, Miriam was HIV positive at the time. And of course, very few people will take a defiled child, mm. uh, so to speak. And uh, Lillian said, we can't keep her. 
And at the same time, we were meeting at my house uh, every Saturday morning with a number of people, Minister of Health, Minister of Women's Affairs, uh, uh, some of the Catholic priests. And we were talking about how, what we were going to do with the children with AIDS. It was hospices for adults, but not for children. And so I ended up taking Miriam. And so Miriam was at these meetings, right? She was just mm -hmm. a baby. But as she was growing, you know, changing and all that good stuff, our talk changed from talking about AIDS with a person attached to talking about a person who happened to have AIDS. Mm -hmm. And that changed how we thought about things. And the result was that there's a half a dozen uh, AIDS hospices for children were developed because of that. Mm -hmm. And Miriam, it's fine. Wow. She's my miracle child. Oh, that's amazing. So she survived and uh, you were able to get yeah. the drugs for her that helped? Uh, I, yeah, well, my biggest problem with Miriam was she developed TB in the lungs and the lymph nodes. And it was that medicine. <laughs> it was free as long as the doctor came every morning and made sure I gave her these meds, you know. Mm. And we did that for eight months and Miriam never looked back after that. She's she's fine. Amazing. Does How old is age? she now? 24. Amazing. Yeah. So that, away, that is quite a Christmas miracle. The choir singing away in the manger. You've got this helpless baby in your hands that you feel is, you know, possibly not going to make it. Um, yeah. She's not being received the way you want her to be received. And then you take her into your own heart, into your own life. And, yeah. uh, and I'm sure the rewards have been exponential. Oh, yes. She's a wonderful person. Um, I'm prejudiced, of course, but she's still <laughs> a wonderful person. Yeah. Uh, full of life and and uh, good with people. Eh? She's naturally compassionate, which, by the way, a lot of Cambodians are. Yeah. Does she help you with your work there? No. Uh, no. Well, she was raised as an international child, eh? so she went to international schools, of uh, which, again, uh, I built one on them. And um, uh, But she was raised with the staff. She knew about poverty and death and all this stuff long before we did. She started house building when she was two, kept that up until she left, uh, Spent had a summer program with the sisters, uh, uh, working with children who couldn't talk she got them all to talk uh, that kind of thing uh, yeah so she's doing good in her own way just like her mom tell me yeah. what it was like for you writing this book revisiting these 25 years uh it, it was good I think um I lost some really good people that I really loved I think mm -hmm. that was the hardest part and uh, the other thing I realized was when you write a book, you can't write negatives. Right. Uh, you know, publishers don't like negatives mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, people don't like negatives. And I just thought, well, that's not reality either. So mm -hmm. basically, I probably write 10 books, but it was uh, it was cathartic. It was good. Absolutely. It is, yeah. So tell me where the road leads you to next. Well, I, uh, right now we're closing Tabitha. Uh, mm -hmm. Our job here is done. Uh, so we're having a final build in January. We got uh, 150 foreigners coming in, all friends of mine from all over the world. We're going to build 90 houses in the first week of January, and that's going to be our final act. Mm -hmm. um, and making sure all our staff and workers have enough money to start a business of their own. And that's worked out really, really well. Uh, very thankful. Yeah. Um, but the hospital, uh, Norcatep, we still have that foundation. And our hospital is becoming the National Cancer Hospital of Cambodia, for which very, very grateful. It's something that uh, was our vision in the beginning mm -hmm. and now becoming reality. It's a public hospital, which means everybody including the poorest can come and make sure that they have treatment um so part of that i'd like to teach uh i'd like to teach others who'd like to try this kind of work talk them through it a bit before they get there 
Absolutely. Yeah, I've seen I'd that. imagine one of the things you witnessed, and I've seen this with survivors from the uh, Cultural Revolution in China, despite the poverty, despite the pain, despite the re-education and the jails and the death, there's such a hopeful resilience among the people who live through something like that. They're survivors. Yeah. And uh, life is precious. And a very, very strong desire to live life to the fullest. So, you know, we're going to have a party. It's a party. Um, uh, if we're going to cry, it's really crying, you know. Right. And what I do find is that uh, crying is your last resort, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, and they're curious, curious about everything. You know, they missed out on education for 30 years. Um you know, how does grass grow, Jan? Right. And, and all these kinds of things. That was a lot of fun. And and how does corn grow? I don't know. I have to study that one, that, that kind of thing. So I learned a whole lot I didn't want to learn, but I did. <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, that's so, wonderful. It's a wonderful story. The name of the book is I Am Who I Am. And she's not quoting Popeye here, but it is called I Am Who I Am, My 25-Year Journey with the Poorest in Cambodia. It's a beautiful story of a woman who has led a beautiful life. Her name is Jan Ritzkis, and uh, I highly recommend this book. Uh, it will inspire you, perhaps, to help others. I think during the Christmas season, this is a message that should go forth as well, as well as every day. Dickens would remind us, not just on Christmas Day. Jan, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. A real honor. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.